Hello, and welcome to Sect Set. That's S E C T S. Now, in this episode, we're going to be looking at a bit more modern French history uh, and examining some of the important religious factors at play during the French Revolution. Particularly, we're going to be talking about the vicious and violent rivalry between traditional French Catholicism and the atheistic ideology known as the cult of reason. And then later, we're going to be looking at Robespierre's short lived and incredibly misguided attempt to reconcile the two into the cult of the Supreme Being. And I'm Michael Albany. This is episode six of Sex Ed, The Reason for the Season. We want to welcome all of you who are listening to us, whether it be on SoundCloud, iTunes, or our brand new YouTube channel. We have a number of different ways that you can listen to Sex Ed, uh, and whether you are a first-time listener or you've been listening to us since the very beginning, uh, we value your feedback no matter what format you're listening to us in. So if you're subscribed to us on iTunes, leave us a rating. If you're subscribed to us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. We value your feedback. And of course, uh, if you like our show, help it grow. You can share our social media pages on Facebook and Twitter, both at Sex Ed. Uh, and with all of that plugging out of the way, we'll begin this episode uh, by examining the debate about whether atheism should itself be considered a religion, which is a debate that goes on to this day. The cult of reason didn't really concern themselves too much with that debate, though. And while atheism means a lack of belief in any deity, the cult of reason was essentially a group that tried uh, to establish a formal religion around the lack of belief, as paradoxical as that might sound. Before we start explaining the condition in which this group came about, we do need to make a note about the word cult in this context. So the cult of reason and the cult of the supreme being are both names that those organizations called themselves, but it's translated from French, so the word cult to them did not have any connotations of being sinister, small, or exclusive like it does in modern English. As we're going to see, some of the believers, uh, or non-believers, of these groups were perfectly capable of acting sinister, but that was not something that was assumed just from the name um, by the people around them. I can tell that it's going to get really confusing if we spend the whole episode calling them non-believers of an anti-religion, uh, and since they were really fine with being talked about like a religion and co-opted a lot of religious terminology to talk about what they were doing, we're just going to talk about them like they are a religion and make everything easier. Sounds good. So, the cult of reason arose during the French Revolution, and so it really can't be understood without examining those events and the historical context in which the cult arose. The French Revolution uh, started up slowly in the tail end of the 1700s, and it built up momentum nearly snowballing out of control. It's one of the biggest and most complicated events in world history, indeed one of the most influential ones. In fact, the French Revolution is considered by some historians to be the start of the modern world, whatever uh, modern actually means. Uh, so what we're going to be doing here is covering the basics. Uh, there were a lot of factors at play that caused the French Revolution, with some of the most important being the massive debts the French crown had as a result of the extensive overseas wars it was engaged in, particularly helping out the Americans in the American Revolution. There were also massive bread shortages, caused in part by tiny fluctuations in global climate, but made much, much worse in France due to government policies which deregulated the grain markets and led to hoarding of grain and speculation for profit during times of famine. And this caused a lot of misery and starvation among the poorer classes while the rich grew richer. The tensions arising from these economic factors were exacerbated by the political situation in France where, where the king was at the top, but beneath him was what was known as the first estate, the Catholic clergy, who we'll be talking about a lot in our episode. And then there was the second estate, the nobility. And finally, you have the third estate, which is everyone else. And as you might have guessed, the first and second estate held the most political power and influence with over 90% of the population belonging to the third estate. In spite of the massive government debt and the famines, France was actually quite economically powerful, and a lot of the debt uh, that the French crown owed was borrowed from members of the growing French middle class, uh, known as the bourgeoisie, who were rather annoyed by the fact that in spite of being uh, wealthy and well-educated, they were still lumped into that third estate, which, uh, as Patrick stated, uh, was everyone else. This mattered because the third estate was the only one that had to pay taxes, so not only was the king taxing uh, the incredibly hungry and angry peasants. He was also trying uh, to pay back borrowed money by taxing the people 
uh, who he in fact borrowed money from. Well, there's a lot more to be said about the causes of the French Revolution in general. We're really going to be focusing specifically on the religious and cultural elements at play that brought about the cult of reason. So if you want a podcast with a broader overview, we highly recommend uh, Revolutions by Mike Duncan, which spends all of season three on the French Revolution. So if you listen to our earlier episode on the Albigensian Crusade, uh, we last left France when they had to violently purge the kingdom of heresy, and in doing so, the power of the king and the Catholic Church had both grown immensely. Uh, In religious terms, the other big event in French history uh, that that we're going to have to mostly skip over were the French Wars of Religion which were a long series of civil wars during the middle of the 1500s in which Protestant and Catholic noble families kept fighting each other over who would be king of France. During those wars, the Protestant population of France was pretty thoroughly crushed, and with many French Protestants, also known as Huguenots, fleeing the country, dying in events like the infamous St. Bartholomew's Day massacres, or simply being politically marginalized, Catholicism became entrenched as the dominant religion in France. Toward the end of that long series of wars, a Protestant king ended up gaining the upper hand militarily, but he converted to Catholicism in order to end the war and solidify his claim to the throne, famously stating, quote, Paris is worth a mass. These wars ended with everyone left alive being pretty exhausted and religious tolerance was declared only to be revoked uh, by a later Catholic king. So by the 1780s then, the population of France was pretty heavily Catholic, but the institution of the Catholic Church in France was very closely tied to the king. The church, in addition to being an extremely wealthy institution that was the largest landowner in France, also played a really major role in the day-to-day life of a lot of people. The church had control over birth, death, and marriage records, and also had influence over what today we would think of as health and education services for large parts of the country. While Catholic priests were still performing a lot of the same duties you would expect from priests today, church officials very commonly also fulfilled roles that we would think of as landlords and civil servants. This mixed role was going to become very important once the revolution starts and people start coming up with new ideas about the proper roles and relationships of religion and government. And it will be especially important in understanding the idea behind the cult of reason. Another important thing to note is that the first estate itself was divided. The local parish priests, monks and lower level members of the church hierarchy, who were closest to the common people, the ones who played the more direct roles important to smaller communities, didn't really get any of the vast wealth that the church as an institution controlled. The Catholic churches were collecting tithes from everyone and collecting rents from tenants on church lands, but all that untaxed money was going to the bishops and abbots higher up in the chain of command. The high-ranking church officials in France were almost entirely people who had been born into the second estate, since the wealthy aristocratic families of France had long since established control over who got appointed to those positions. So just like uh, we mentioned back in our Cathar episode hundreds of years earlier, a church career had long been considered an excellent choice for the younger sons of these families, who weren't likely to inherit especially since finding an acceptable marriage for younger sons wasn't always the easiest. So essentially, you had the uh, sons who were born first going into political careers, uh, and then sons born afterward because they're not inheriting the lands or the titles as much of their parents. They're getting those uh, high-level religious careers instead. Mm -hmm. And the celibacy definitely helped keep the numbers down in those aristocratic families and and remove the whole issue of finding a marriage for them. By the 1780s, the control that the nobility had over the upper levels of the Catholic Church in France was more extensive than it had ever been before. And since Protestantism was not seen as an option for many French people, it was difficult to separate criticisms of the obvious corruptions in the church with criticisms of the church itself. Beyond that, since the church and the monarchy were so very heavily entwined, it was really hard to separate criticisms of the church from criticisms of the king. The other religious element that we need to examine in France before the start of the revolution are the concepts of deism and atheism, uh, which are both already present and increasingly popular leading up to the revolution. Deism is a concept that was enormously popular among a lot of French and American revolutionaries and philosophers who embraced the ideas of the Enlightenment. Deism in general is a belief that whatever type of God exists, It is not directly involved in the lives of humans, uh, and that we can only understand the world around us through observation and reason. There's a lot of variations 
but it was common for deists to believe in and value moral and social elements of Christianity and worship while rejecting all or most ideas about miracles, revelations, anything that was supernatural or superstitious. And a common metaphor used by deists is this idea of a clockmaker god, the idea that there is some higher power which created the universe, but now uh, just leaves it to its own devices, its components all clicking independently. And for we humans who are living in that sort of world, the only way to understand it is to investigate it on its own terms. People who were raised in various types of Christian churches throughout Europe and North and South America who valued reason and observation and harbored deep doubts and criticisms about organized religion tended to move towards deism. Uh, deism, however, was not a standalone religion in any way leading up to the French Revolution. People with a deist outlook would generally remain a part of whatever church they had been born into. And especially wealthy or intellectual believers often simply rejected a lot of the teachings of their church without actually leaving it. When it comes to the more scientific elements of deism, though, there's a lot of thoughts about nature, examining the natural state of the world and discussing uh, the natural state of humanity and what it is or what it should be, and arguing about to what degree a deity actually interferes in the workings of reality. As wealthy people from all three of the French estates became more and more well-educated and really started examining the world around them, people from all of these estates became caught up in the problem of fitting the new information that they learned about the world with the religious traditions that often clashed with it. So deism was a great way to be able to just pick and choose, to ignore it and discard parts of their religion uh, that no longer made any sense to them while keeping the parts that they liked. There was also commonly a tendency for deists to regard the formal and politically active hierarchy of the church with a lot of scorn and to be very uh, adamant in opposing the clergy specifically um, separate from the religion, but that, uh, as we said, is kind of hard for people to do, um, but they definitely tried. And there's a lot of deists who also just pay lip service to the parts of the religion that they don't believe in. Uh, this quote from Voltaire in a letter to the King of Prussia illustrates one of the strains of deist thought. Quote, our religion is assuredly the most vicious, the most absurd, and the most bloody religion which has ever infected this world. Your majesty will do the human race an eternal service by extirpating this infamous superstition. I do not say among the rabble who are not worthy of being enlightened and who are apt for every yoke. I say among honest people, among men who think, among those who wish to think." End quote. The scientific studies of the natural world, then, were a big part of what pushed people to embrace this deist outlook, but it should be noted that there is an even older view of nature that was present within the medieval Catholic Church that has some striking similarities. Towards the end of the Middle Ages, there was a concept called the Book of Nature, which had sort of died out before the French Revolution started, but a lot of deists came back to the same points. The Book of Nature was the idea that God had created two books and that the Bible was only one of them. The other book that needed to be read, they said, was nature itself. Everything in the natural world that could be studied and understood with the human mind needed to be read like a book and put together uh, and paid just as much attention to as the Bible, because without it, humans could never really understand or be close to God. The book of nature was really associated with the Renaissance, and deism was associated with the Age of Enlightenment. But in both cases, as scientific understanding of the world progressed, the religious views of intellectuals shifted to accommodate it, but not necessarily to clash with it. Atheists, though, took their many conflicts with church doctrines and a lot of these same points that led people to deism and then took it a step further. Atheists were the ones who just flat out denied the existence of God and had no problem opposing the church itself and the organization of the church. Uh, the deists and the atheists were very often united in their deep-seated distaste for what they viewed as the use of the church as a greedy and corrupt tool for keeping the masses ignorant and subservient. Especially in the early stages as the revolution starts to boil over, they find themselves a lot of the time on the same side of the conflict. But later on, after the revolution has progressed a great deal, they start clashing amongst themselves. Um, the grudges that various atheists had against the Catholic Church were very often deeply personal ones. Uh, and as we're going to see once we start talking about the founders of the cult of reason, some of them have uh, very personal family reasons to be annoyed with the Catholic Church. The people writing about and spreading these ideas were known as philosophs. And with the easy availability of the printing press, essentially anyone uh, could get their hands on one and print anything they wanted. The Catholic Church, as we mentioned, actually played a big role in education, especially in the countryside, in more underserved communities. So uh, while they weren't really collecting information about the literacy rate, it was actually very high, even among the lower classes in France. Uh, it carried 
It varied a lot by region, but in some parts of the cities, it may have been as high as roughly 70 to 80 percent. And even in the remote countryside, it could have been around 30 to 40 percent. So even for those who couldn't read, it would have been very easy to find someone who could read these new works for you. There was also a lot of discussion and debate going on about these topics in person at various types of gatherings. And as you can imagine, the days before television and movies, having these kinds of discussions were a great way to spend your free time, especially in the middle and upper classes who, were, who had more free time. Another important sort of cultural element that's going to play a big role is the admiration that a lot of the French revolutionaries had for Republican Rome and for classical everything, essentially. Um, they loved Republican Rome and the Greek city-states and all that went with it. And so common themes that we'll see throughout the French Revolution are themes of civilization versus barbarians, um, and the Kingdom of France and the monarchy of France, the ancient regime, goes all the way back, in theory, to Charlemagne and the Kingdom of the Franks, who were barbarians who overran the Roman territory of Gaul and set up France essentially as a barbarian kingdom. And that idea was something that French revolutionaries, once they started opposing the king and identifying a lot more with the Romans, got brought up a lot in just their angry rhetoric. Many French revolutionary leaders had read works by Roman political philosophers like Cicero and Cato, and reading these old classical books was a very common part of higher education before the revolution. These ancient Roman writers that they read so often were always hearkening back to an earlier time when the Roman Republic had been perfect, when men and women had been virtuous and free, when barbarians had been subdued, and the future seemed bright and boundless. These ideas and this description of ancient Rome took a very strong hold in the imaginations of a lot of French and American revolutionaries, which is why even today in America we have a Senate named after the Roman Senate, why America and France would both call themselves republics like the ancient Roman Republic, and why our government buildings are almost always built in classical Greco-Roman style. And this is also why scenes of Roman civic virtue are everywhere in the French art of the time period. Now, in the 1700s, as people were reading all of these kinds of Roman writings, it all sounded really great compared to their modern political situations, and they were pining for the good old days just like Cicero and Cato were. But they didn't really have enough sources, apparently, to connect the dots uh, like we do today and realize that when Cicero and Cato were writing about how back in the day everything was perfect, they themselves would be used by a later Roman generation as examples of, oh, I wish things were like the days of Cicero and Cato, everything was perfect. And it just sort of, in Roman writings especially, there's a long chain of whatever time period they're in in Roman history, they think it's terrible and things were great the generation before, and the generation before says the same thing, and so on and so on. Um, so with the rediscovery of these writings, essentially a lot of these revolutionaries just jumped right back into that chain. And they definitely overlooked, uh, in a large part, they idealized Roman society quite a bit and overlooked the massive violence and bloodshed and brutality that the Roman Republic and Empire both committed. And while many prominent thinkers and politicians of the French Revolution idolized ancient Rome, religiously they were pretty far from anything we, we might think of as neo-pagan. The Greek and Roman gods were held in high cultural esteem, but there's going to be a lot of new ones invented and celebrated who are thoroughly modern, or at least were considered thoroughly modern in the 1700s. And this obsession with ancient Greece and Rome is going to be present in almost all the different aspects of the French Revolution, sort of influencing their, their overall aesthetic. But it definitely influences the religious developments as well in a big way. So with all that background information out of the way, let's get into the revolution itself. In the spring of 1789, King Louis XVI summoned the Estates General to help him come up with a solution to the very dire budget situation. This was a strange move since the representatives of the three estates had not been called for over a hundred years. But the French Parliament was dominated by individuals who would refuse to support increased taxes, and it was thought that this would be a way to go around their opposition. Of course, the very first issue raised to this assembly of the Estates General caused it all to fall apart. Namely, how many votes should each of the estates get? Essentially, the king assumed that each estate would get a vote, with nobility and clergy able to team up and overturn the commoners on every issue. The third estate, of course, represented the vast majority of the population. It was pretty outraged by this. Uh, and so this ended in the third estate going off to one of the king's tennis courts and deciding uh, they were going to write a constitution instead of just helping the king with his budget problems. It should be noted, though, that the representatives of the third estate were almost entirely wealthy lawyers, landowners, and businessmen of the middle class. 
and even some members of the nobility uh, who had got themselves elected as third estate representatives. The representatives of the third estate then declared themselves the National Assembly, with many members of the clergy actually joining them. But the very first thing this new self-proclaimed governing body did was abolish the rights of the church to be exempt from taxes, as well as abolishing the right of the church to collect special tithes, uh, which had been another form of taxation that the church could impose and collect on their own. Well, we don't have time to go step by step through every major event of the French Revolution. As the political situation continues to escalate, it becomes more and more violent, and new governments rise and fall, and political factions vie for power, and there's a lot of names changing, um, the Catholic clergy of France will essentially find themselves increasingly forced to take sides in the conflict. Uh, among the many endless debates going on during the French Revolution, the main one we're going to be concerned with is the debate over what role the Catholic Church was to play in France as it turned from ancient feudal monarchy to constitutional monarchy to radical revolutionary republic. After the abolition of feudal rights and the special privileges that the Church had long received from the King, the next issue that would arise for the Church came from the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. This document spells out what were seen as the natural rights of all men, universal and self-evident, and they were really the main ideals that the French Revolution was built around. When it came to religion, the Declaration stated, Article 4. Liberty consists of doing anything which does not harm others. Thus, the exercise of the natural rights of each man has only those borders which assure other members of society enjoy the same rights. These borders can be determined only by the law. And then Article 10. No one may be disturbed for his opinions, even religious ones, provided that their manifestation does not trouble the public order established by law. The part about providing it does not trouble the public order established by law is what will cause the most religious conflict, as the Catholic Church was so deeply tied uh, in so many ways to the old regime, and was so important for a lot of civil services and education throughout France that their teachings could be seen as troubling the public order and clashing with the law in many different places. In just a little over a month, the new National Assembly had gone from outlawing special church privileges and tax exemptions to seizing the vast lands and wealth of the church and selling them off in order to provide funding for the new government and deal with the massive budget problems of the king, who at that point was still alive and still king, but was a constitutional monarch, bound by the new laws the assembly had come up with. Though the church in France had long been subordinate to and in service of the state, when the state meant the king, in 1790 the National Assembly forced the king's hand and, against his objections, made the clergy in France officially a part of the French civil service. In 1790, with the passing of the civil constitution of the clergy, all Catholic priests in France were required to swear a loyalty oath as public servants, and all monastic orders were disbanded, except for those directly involved in running health or educational services. Now, the church essentially was to become a department of the new French government, and this was really a line in the sand with the mandatory oath designed to make each clergy member publicly declare that their loyalty to the church came second to their loyalty to France, even in religious matters. For any priest refusing to take this oath, that would pretty clearly be seen by the assembly as troubling the public order as established by law, and they would be removed from their position and replaced by a priest who would swear the oath. These priests and bishops uh, would also be elected rather than appointed, in keeping with the revolutionary ideals. About half the priests in France immediately did swear the oath, and declared that their allegiance was to France. About half the priests in France immediately swore the oath and declared that their allegiance to France came first before their loyalty to the Pope. But the other half decided to wait to see what the Pope had to say about this, uh, with opposition to the oath especially strong amongst the higher-ups in the church hierarchy. Pope Pius VI fretted and thought about it and delayed commenting about this for a while, but ultimately he decided to throw down a challenge right back and declared that taking the oath was against Catholic beliefs and that any priest who took the oath would have to be replaced. This created a situation where the political ideology of each priest had split the Catholic Church right down the middle in France, and every church and believer was essentially forced to decide publicly if they stood for the revolution or against it. The priests who refused to take the oath were known as non-juring priests, and they were banned from preaching, baptizing, and performing marriages by the French government, but continued to do so in spite of the ban. At the same time, the juring priests, the ones who had take, taken the oath, 
Um, they were banned from preaching, baptizing, and performing marriages by the Catholic Church. So essentially both sides of this issue considered the other side not to be real priests. Meanwhile, war was in the air. Tensions were rising between the various European monarchies. Uh, they started fearing that the radical revolutionaries of France would spread their new ideology to neighboring nations. And in the National Assembly of France, there were some factions which wanted to do exactly that. In the end, the King of France was caught and arrested while trying to flee the country, allegedly to join up with the enemies of France and bring down the revolution with foreign armies, which was seen as a horrendous betrayal by many of the revolutionaries and treason against the new government that had been formed. In the summer of 1792, after the arrest of the king, France declared war on Austria and Prussia. In the fall of 1792 then, all the non-juring priests in France and those who supported them were essentially enemies of the revolution and had no say in the decisions that would be made by national French government. This meant that the voices of the deists and the atheists, many of whom had been around for a while, were amplified a great deal. It's at this point in 1792 that the cult of reason finally emerges as a distinct entity, which bursts onto the scene as an organized religion with a fanatical, violent hatred of organized religions. When it comes to talking about the French Revolution, there's something I've always found a bit difficult to balance. There's these huge society-wide sweeping changes, there's massive groups of people in categories like royalists, revolutionaries, Jacobins, non-adjuring priests, nobility, clergy, all that, but there's a lot of things that historians tend to describe with these broad, all-encompassing categories, and there are terms and events that can sometimes sound almost mythical. At the same time, there are so many real people involved, people who are writing, who we have a lot of sources about, people who might fall into one or more of those bigger categories, but none of them ever really fit perfectly into those categories, and they're all really sort of fuzzy, as you might imagine, because real life often is. So there's a lot that happens that's personal. There's a lot of unique individuals playing their part, trying to impose their own uh, stamp on history. And... In most of the episodes we've done so far, there's one or two individuals around whom the whole story revolves. These self-proclaimed kings and prophets who take old religious traditions and change them into something new. But in the French Revolution, it's such a huge event, it seems harder to describe the influence that one person actually has on the events. Uh, to what extent are these individuals just reacting and caught up in things bigger than themselves, and how much are they actually influencing the events that are transpiring? So are these people a product of their times, or are the times a product of these people? In our next episode, we'll be talking a lot more about Robespierre and the cult of the Supreme Being, where that sort of conflict and how to tell the story will become more pronounced. But for now, we do need to look at some of the main individuals behind the cult of reason. The many men who would create the cult of reason were uh, oftentimes journalists and politicians, and many of them were known as the enragés, or the enraged ones, for their furious and passionate tirades against the nobility, and more importantly for our story, against the church. So the first individual we're going to delve into, one of the founders of the Cult of Reason, is Jacques Hébert. He and his political faction in Paris were some of the strongest opponents of the Catholic Church during the events we just described. The followers of Hébert, known as the Héberists, uh, would evolve into the main core of support of the Cult of Reason, to the point where belonging to the Cult of Reason was one of the main signs that an individual was politically an Héberist and vice versa. As a journalist, playwright, and occasional thief, uh, Hébert was known in the lead-up to the revolution primarily for publishing a journal called Père Duchesne. Père Duchesne was a fictional character who embodied a lot of lower-class Parisian criticisms of the aristocracy and the clergy, and through this character, Hébert launched criticisms against just about everyone. He was noted for his extremely filthy and vulgar language and insults, mimicking the profanity-laden speaking habits of the poorer classes of Paris in an effort to gain popularity with them, which was a deliberate strategy that won him a lot of supporters and fans. He was notable for calling the queen, Marie Antoinette, a uh, for calling King Louis the Sixteenth a uh, and a uh, and he told everyone who would listen that the Pope was almost certainly a uh, in terms of modern political commentary, he seems like he's somewhere between John Oliver and South Park, with a firm ideological stance, but he's always going for the most shocking or gross-out statements. His criticisms of the Pope, the King, the nobility, and the clergy all ramped up as he was caught up in the events of the French Revolution, and they grew more and more radical over time. In 1781, Hébert was part of a large crowd present at the Champ-de-Mars massacre. 
The Champ de Mars massacre took place shortly after the arrest of the king, when Lafayette, hero of the American Revolution, and up to that point, pretty well regarded supporter of the French Revolution, ordered his troops to fire on the crowd who had assembled to protest against what they viewed as their treasonous king. This was similar in a lot of ways to the Boston Massacre, with an angry mob facing off against armed soldiers, throwing rocks, and uh, afterwards, Hebert was pretty furious that he had been fired at and many of his comrades had been killed, and his angry rhetoric really took off. Uh, the f absolutely filthy language just got even filthier, and he really started inflaming public opinion against aristocrats like Lafayette and other members of the first and second estate who had been supporting the revolution, but not enough in his view. It was around this time that Hebert became involved with a woman who would later become his wife, a former Catholic nun who had been defrocked, and who shared in many ways his hatred of the Catholic Church. Never afraid to say exactly what he was thinking in the harshest of terms, Hebert also did not shy away from encouraging violence, and in September 1792, he wrote in support of what became known as the September Massacres, uh, where angry mobs of radicals in Paris murdered hundreds of counter-revolutionary prisoners, fearing that the approaching Prussian and Austrian armies, who had just won a battle against the French army, would liberate the non-juring priests and aristocrats who were imprisoned in Paris and use them to roll back the revolution. The followers and fans of Hebert would eventually become uh, the main group of believers in the cult of reason. These people are also most famously uh, known as the sans Uh They often poor lower classes of Paris whose politics revolved around more the crippling bread shortages than anything else. In the more stereotypical depictions of the French Revolution, these are the closest to the angry, bloodthirsty mob that is most commonly depicted. The massacres began with an angry mob murdering about 20 non-juring priests who were being transported to prison and then escalated from there. After this massacre, ultimately 115 clergymen murdered by the mob were beatified by the Pope and declared martyrs. And the idolization of martyrs would actually become something the cult of reason and the Catholic Church had in common. Another journalist in Enrage who was heavily involved in developing the cult of reason was Antoine Francois Momoro, who, working closely with Hebert, helped publish his vulgar political rants. While Hebert and Momoro used their popular publications to incite angry mobs to murder priests, they were not the only journalists using their strong popularity with the masses of Paris to encourage mob violence in defense of the revolution. Jean-Paul Marat was by far the more popular journalist, and his furious tirades against the more moderate revolutionaries played a major role in bringing about the bloodshed that would later make the French Revolution so infamous. Early in 1793, shortly after executing the deposed former King Louis XVI, Marat, Hebert, and other Paris radicals and their followers helped to oust the Girondins and bring the more radical Jacobins like Jerobes Pierre and Danton into power, and ushered in what would become known as the Reign of Terror. Uh, after helping to send many of the leaders of the Girondins, who were the more moderate revolutionary faction, to the guillotine, Marat in particular was really in his moment of triumph. Marat himself was actually a Protestant, coming from a family of Huguenots, whose religious freedom had previously depended on the whims of kings, but he would quickly become one of the most prominent martyrs idolized by the cult of reason. Uh, Marat suffered from a debilitating and painful skin condition that caused him to spend a great deal of time in medicinal baths, and while he was taking one of these baths in July of 1793, a Girondin sympathizer who felt the revolution had become too radical and bloodthirsty managed to stab him to death. His killer, a woman named Charlotte Corday, is still regarded highly favorably by a number of people, and she was guillotined quickly for the murder within a few days, but she became known as the Angel of Assassination and famously claimed, I have killed one man to save thousands. And her story is actually really interesting, but for the purposes of the cult of reason, they, they were pretty furious. Um, Hebert and his followers could not have disagreed more with the people who idolized Corday, and Hebert began portraying himself as the natural successor to Marat, as the leader of some of the most violent and radical forces of the revolution, while Momoro did the same thing. As both of these men became leaders in the city government of Paris, they both worked to make Marat held up as a sort of martyr saint for their newly emerging cult of reason. Another major figure in the cult of reason was Anarchus Klutz, a Prussian from a Dutch family who brought to the cult his ideas of universality and international appeal. The cult of reason that developed from atheistic enlightenment ideas was meant to be a universal new religion, one that would preach the ideas of the enlightenment to the entire world. 
As described in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, members of the cult saw their ideas as being natural, self-evident, and clear to anyone whose mind was not clouded with ignorance and superstition. An elected member of the French National Assembly, Clutes was known to call himself the personal enemy of Jesus Christ and vigorously supported what became known as the de-Christianization of France. In another display of the cult of reason co-opting Catholic terminology, he described himself as abjuring religion. Clutes would be involved heavily with the formal organizing and activities of the cult of reason and described the beliefs of the cult as explicitly a religion of man, in which the principles of atheism and individual liberty were held in the highest regard. Several other politicians and journalists played important roles in the formation of the cult of reason. So many that it's going to be difficult to cover them all. This is uh, unlike a lot of the things we've covered before that sort of slowly evolve as one or two people build this religion. This had a lot of different things going into it and then a lot of people all coalesced at once, uh, emerging in, in its final form right off the bat, essentially. While the cult of reason is very militant and violent, a lot of their actual beliefs don't sound all that different from things I see on social media all the time. Here's a quote from another prominent Cult of Reason member. Everyone knows that humans are nothing more than what education makes of them, and thus if one wants them just, one must furnish them with notions of fairness, not ideas from seventh heaven, because the sources of all humans' grief are ignorance and superstition. Uh, is that most of them... Oh, sorry. One of the main parallels that I can see between the Cult of Reason and the Catholic faith that most of them were rebelling against is their aspiration to be universal. The word Catholic itself comes from a Greek phrase meaning universal or with regards to the whole. And the cult of reason saw their beliefs as applying to the whole world and everyone in it, whether they believed in this or not. The unshakable certainty and fanaticism, the dividing of the world up into good and evil, their focus on virtue and purity, were from the very start one of the main characteristics of the cult of reason. Having been founded by many members of the city government of Paris, known as the Paris Commune, as well as members of the national revolutionary French government, the cult of reason was explicitly intended as a replacement for the Catholic Church, which by 1793 had become seen by some members with the radical Hebraist faction as counter-revolutionary. While paranoia and conspiracy theories abounded among members of the cult of reason, as we see with other cults like Heaven's Gate or People's Temple, the idea that the Catholic Church was counter-revolutionary was definitely not completely unfounded. In response to those first massacres of Catholic priests back in September of 1792, an armed resistance to the revolutionary government had begun in the more rural areas of France, far from the busy capital of Paris, where the cult of reason was strongest. All those French priests who had refused to take the oath of loyalty to the revolutionary state had not simply been sitting around the whole time after the French government declared that they weren't priests anymore in areas where education was controlled more by the Catholic Church, where the population was primarily farmers and the devotion to the Catholic Church was strongest, armies began to form to oppose the laws passed by Paris. And the escalation of violence against the Catholics coming out of Paris was met with escalating violence from Catholics in the countryside. These armies called themselves the Catholic Army, with one of the most prominent being the Catholic Army of the Vendée, named after the Vendée region of France, which was their home. Initially just peasant armies assembled to fight a guerrilla war against the revolutionary armies of France, these forces eventually came to fight for the restoration of the French monarchy, changing their names to the Catholic and Royal Army of the Vendée. The war in the Vendée was one of the most brutal of these counter-revolutionary uprisings. During the events we've talked about, after Marat and the enraged ones purged the moderates, the laws punishing priests who refused to swear those loyalty oaths had become harsher and harsher, eventually decreeing death for any non-juring priests and anyone who would harbor them. In the Vendée, this decree was in the Vendée, this degree would cause massive loss of life, as revolutionary armies fought to de-Christianize France by force, desecrating churches and turning them into temples of reason, destroying crucifixes and replacing them with busts of martyred revolutionary saints like Marat, and even destroying the cross markers in graveyards, and even putting up signs on all the graveyards removing any references to an afterlife, declaring death is an eternal sleep. Jacques Fouché was particularly zealous and an infamous military commander who enforced the de-Christianization efforts in the countryside. And while he did set up his own atheistic rituals and religious practices to replace the Catholic ones he was raging war against, it's not clear whether he was actually a part of the cult or just doing something very, very similar on his own. While Paris, the mob, and the guillotine are the most prevalent images of the French Revolution and pop culture these days, 
the counter-revolutionary insurgencies in the countryside were also incredibly violent and horrific. The Catholic resistance was for the most part crushed in the end, which was followed by massacres of civilian priests, monks, and nuns. The revolutionary forces even started experimenting with new forms of mass execution, particularly by imprisoning hundreds of Catholic and Royalist sympathizers onto the lower levels of boats and then sinking the boats to drown them all at once in the rivers. In keeping with the habit of the cult of reason for co-opting Catholic terminology, these mass executions by drowning were known as Republican baptisms. Back in Paris, the cult of reason was really taking off throughout the year 1793, which was by far the high watermark for the group in terms of numbers and influence. Just as a bit of a side note, uh, we've been using the Gregorian calendar this whole time, but one of the most widely known facts about the French Revolution that many of you already know is that a totally new revolutionary calendar was adopted by the government of France during the French Revolution. This new revolutionary calendar was designed with the intention of purging traditional Christian influence from the daily calendar and replacing it with a new revolutionary one based on rationality and natural themes, describing the climate of each season. As I think we mentioned back in the Cathar episode, the Christian calendar in use in France was just riddled with feast days and holidays commemorating saints, and part of the idea behind introducing this calendar was breaking the influence that the church had over the day-to-day -day life of the French people, especially for farmers in the countryside. So in the year 1793, we had the high watermark for the power and influence of the cult of reason, but they would be more likely to describe it as year two, since they'd start marking time as the number of years since the revolution started, rather than counting the years since the birth of Christ, calling it 1793. In Paris on November 10th, 1793, or 20th of Brumière, year 2, as the war in Vendée was drawing to a close and the revolutionary forces known as the Infernal Columns were massacring civilians in the reconquered royalist region, the Cult of Reason hosted their biggest and most extravagant non-religious holiday, the Festival of Reason. The festival was organized as a celebration of reason, the guiding concept after which the cult had been named. It was at this massive festival that many of the core ideas of the Cult of Reason were revealed to the world, along with their intentions to make it the dominant religion in France, if not the dominant religion in the world. A lot has been written about what actually happened at the Festival of Reason, but given how wildly unpopular the adherents had become with all their priest murdering and church desecrating, a lot of sources probably exaggerated it for propaganda purposes, but it was definitely a huge and bizarre event. The Festival of Reason was held in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, which was rededicated before a large crowd as a Temple of Reason. Statues of Christian martyrs in Notre Dame were damaged, with the statues of kings in particular being beheaded, and new statues and busts of the revolutionary martyrs, particularly Marat, were installed in the cathedral. The altar of Notre Dame was dismantled and replaced with a new altar to liberty, and the words to philosophy were inscribed over the entrance. An actress portraying the goddess of liberty was worshipped, and speeches were given by prominent founders of the cult. Bishops and priests were made to attend and to renounce the Catholic Church and swear new oaths to the French Republic and the cult of reason. It was described specifically as a civic religion, and here again we can see a lot of the French revolutionary obsession with ancient Rome. The idea of ancient Roman religion as a civic religion was first brought up by Rousseau, and he was considered a favorite Enlightenment philosopher by many of the founders of the cult of reason. A civic religion or a civil religion is one that exists in order to inspire the virtues necessary for the success of a state. This way of thinking about religion as a form of political and social control necessary for bringing about conditions in which a cohesive society can thrive was very much in the forefront of the minds of the people developing the cult of reason. In spite of their vehement opposition to nearly everything about the Catholic Church, they did still see a lot of value in the institution of a church. Preachers and rituals and holidays and devotion were all seen as critical for instilling and strengthening the moral principles which they thought society depended on. So it was those aspects of the faith that the cult of reason maintained while opposing basically everything else. Still, it would be wrong to think of it as just a cynical ploy intended only to manipulate people. The believers in the cult of reason really believed, for lack of a better word, in a sort of transcendent higher good that was embodied in liberty, equality, fraternity, and indeed that famous phrase was coined by one of the cult's creators. As Clutes proclaimed to the crowd during the festival, there is only one God, the people. Momoro, who had done a great deal to organize the festival, and whose wife Sophie was said to have appeared as the provocatively dressed goddess of reason, would explain more about the reason behind the festival of reason, saying, Liberty, reason, and truth are only abstract beings. They are not gods, for properly speaking, they are part of ourselves. 
The festival originally was going to be attended by all members of the National Assembly, but in the end, it stopped just short of receiving official support of the French government. This was due to the vehement opposition to the cult by an enormously influential figure in the French Revolution, Maximilien Robespierre, who was known as the Incorruptible. Though the men who had founded the cult of reason were instrumental in bringing him to power in the first place, Robespierre would see to it that the first festival of reason would also be the last. We've mentioned in passing here and there, but the atheistic cult of reason was not the only new religion trying to fill the power vacuum left behind by the Catholic Church. Robespierre, it turns out, had a cult of his own. And in the next episode, we'll pick this story back up as the leaders of the cult of reason are sent to the guillotine, and Robespierre and the cult of the supreme being get their own moment of glory. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albany and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is created under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at Leader, the lab for the education and advancement in digital research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.